introduce Mark Puente, the associate, he's the um, director of diversity programming um, for the Association of Research Libraries. And he can have the floor and tell you more about himself as he comes forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is this thing on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, my, my life isn't that interesting, but I, I can tell you more about it later if there's time. I want to dive right into the content because I think it's important content. There's a lot of it to go through. I probably have about an hour, about a 90-minute presentation here, but the hallmark of a good experience for me is when I don't get through all of the content because you're engaged, you have questions, you want to have uh, discussions, that sort of thing. So I welcome that. Uh, let me just start by saying a couple of things. First of all, I, I am probably one of the last Luddites uh, that is a Twitter holdout. So I, if, I'm not on Twitter. So if you hear something from me today that really resonates with you or that you really think is, is, is horrible, uh, please don't Twitter tweet out at Mark, dot, or Mark Puente at, at, at Twitter because then some, some journalist in Tampa Bay will then send me an email and will tell me yet again, please, please tell your audience, like I have an audience, uh, <laughs> not, not, not to tweet out at me uh, when, when you're giving presentations. So I, I've done uh, that due diligence. Um, the other thing that I want to start off with before we dive into the content is um, I understand, I, I do a lot of this work, I do lots of engagement with uh, libraries, with, with academic libraries, largely with the AOL membership. I get uh, that this is hard, that this is very hard work. I understand that. I also understand that having conversations like this can be very, very uncomfortable. Um, I, I, I just want you to know, for, and this is my personal posture about this type of work, as I do not come to this work uh, and I do not engage with people out of a sense of wanting to shame people uh, or, or create guilt. Uh, in, in, in the people that I'm engaging with. So uh, now, that doesn't mean that you, we all shouldn't be challenged, right? That doesn't mean that growth doesn't come out of pain <laughs> and discomfort. And I invite you to embrace discomfort because uh, I don't think that you know, we've been having these conversations in this profession, really in, in, our, in our society for many, many decades. We have not made a lot of progress uh, in, in, in these conversations. And until we really embrace that, that discomfort uh, and acknowledge a lot of the pain that uh, ha is, is a product of some of the systems that create the need to have conversations like this, uh, we're really not going to get anywhere. So I really invite you to kind of embrace that and just know that, that, that I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I feel this with you. So let's just dive into this a little bit. Um, I want to tell you that I think that uh, a, a good way to, st to start this conversation is just to have a conversation about taxonomy, about definitions, right? Uh, have a conversation uh, clarifying some of the terminology that I will use that, that I'm sure all of you have heard about. And so let's, let's just go through this a little bit. Um, bias, explicit and implicit, conscious and unconscious. Um, I think it's important for us to realize that we all form positive and negative preferences for groups based on attitudes, based on stereotypes that might have formed really over a course of, of many years, over a course of a lifetime. And this can be explicit you know, or conscious, or they can be implicit or unconscious. Uh, unconscious or implicit biases are really a product of something we'll discuss later called schema or schema biases. That is the core beliefs that are very much resistant to change. So we'll talk a lot more about that. I'll deconstruct that a bit more as we go on. Um, prejudice. So the thing to remember, remember about prejudice is that prejudice is an attitude toward members of you know, particular groups uh, based solely on their, their identification with or their membership. I think identification is a better term um, in that particular group. Prejudice can be positive or it can also be negative as well. Um, discrimination. Discrimination is actual positive or negative actions uh, toward uh, objects of prejudice. Okay, so of those previously uh, a mentioned group. Um, stereotyping, that's the sort of gross generalizations about the, the, the typical characteristics of uh, members of those particular groups. You know, this, she's, she's, an, she's an Asian and so she's going to drive a particular way. He's from a, a Latin culture, he's always, you know, coming to meetings late. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, so there's just gross generalizations that because they identify as X, they are going to behave as, as A, B, and C, okay? Um, racism. This is, this, this is one point that I hope 
if you remember nothing else about this, this, this conversation, about this presentation, that you're going to remember this particular point. Racism is when prejudice and discrimination, both attitudes and actions, both of those, are actually supported by laws, by institutions, by culture, and by systems, okay? Racism is a systemic phenomenon, okay? So that's the, if you, if you can check out after this, okay? After, if you just, if you understand that, okay? So, so let's, let's dive a little bit into what unconscious bias is. <coughs> you know, scientists estimate that at any given moment, uh, human beings are exposed to about 11 million pieces of data at any one, at any one moment. 11 million, that's a lot of data, <laughs> okay? But in fact, the human brain is only capable of processing about 50 or 60 pieces of those data at any one time. So this thing, implicit bias, what it does is it helps us to kind of fill in the holes, right? And the, the, the conscious gets instantaneously uh, processed into the subconscious. You know, does anybody, um, anybody have the experience of driving a stick shift? Learning how to drive a stick shift? Yeah, do, does those still exist anymore? Are they manufactured anymore? But I remember that when I first learned how to do that in my brother's three-day-old BMW, I was so nervous. But, you know, think, you know, you have to think about, okay, you apply just, you know, this much pressure, pressure on the clutch and you have to, you know, this much pressure on the accelerator and everything and then the car dies if you don't do that right, right? But, you know, after three months, four months, it just, it just, it's just automatic. You don't have to think about it. So I'm, this is a form, uh, this is a schema. This is a form of bias there. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's continue about that. So bias um, are mental shortcuts. And the science around it is around this schema or schemas, uh, which are really a set of propositions or mental constructs for, here's the important word, for relationships. Okay? What they do, what these schema do is they create generalizations and expectations about categories of objects, of places, of events, of activities, and mo most importantly in this context of people. Okay? So we use schema every day in order to make sense out of the world around us and to really navigate that incredible volume of data that we were talking about uh, a little bit uh, earlier, those 11 million pieces of data. So the example on this slide, of course, um, you know, many, several examples here, the, the square, okay? You know, we know what that is, right? It's, it's a square, it's two-dimensional, you know, the same, all sides are, are equal. We, we, we don't need to think about what are the requirements for being a square before we recognize that's a square, right? Same thing about, you know, about animals, same thing about, uh, you know, we could, a flower, I give the example of a kitten. <laughs> so unconscious brain helps us deal with the mundane and the routine, where the conscious brain is the mediator of novelty and of learning, okay? So we also have schema for ourselves and for other people. And these schemas are also, they also carry with them certain expectations. So think about, of course, schema that might exist for librarian, right? Those typical stereotypes. Okay, so here we go. You can laugh. It's okay if you're <laughs> okay. So diving a little bit more deeply into what implicit bias is, we can think of implicit bias as a lens through which we view the world, a lens which automatically, instantaneously filters how we take in and act on information, um, and that lens is always present in our lives. These implicit social categorizations or biases are seen at, they, they are, in fact, deeply, deeply held, even for those of us who do this sort of work. I attended a, um, a presentation uh, by, uh, at ACRL not too long ago by a very, a very well-respected practitioner, uh, um, whose name, Birna, I can't remember her last name, but anyway, but she was talking about her, her experience about, she was talking about her own, her own bias um, and related to, to getting onto a plane. So she gets onto a plane, she tells this great story, and, and she's getting settled in, and she's you know, having a good time, and you know, all this sort of thing, and then all of a sudden, the captain gets on, on, on the intercom, and the captain is, is the voice of a woman. And she's like, whoa, I hope she can drive. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, so these are biases that just you know, creep into to everybody at, at, at any point in time. Now, implicit biases do not necessarily lead to explicitly biased decisions or behaviors, okay? They do not necessarily lead to that, but they may, and they frequently do, and they very well may predict discriminatory, non-verbal, subtle behaviors such as, I don't know, sitting further away, farther away from someone who is different, uh, maybe cutting an interview short or not engaging or asking follow-up questions in an interview, 
uh, because you have a bias uh, about that particular person and, and their identity, or maybe you know holding on to a bag or something when you're passing someone in the hall who looks a little bit different. So all of these really subtle behaviors are very much a product of this instantaneous processing. It's important to think about both attitudes and stereotype. Attitudes are those evaluative, evaluative feelings that, again, can either be positive or negative, uh, and also the stereotypes, those traits that we associate with a, with a certain category, of, well, many categories of people, okay? So let me just stop there. Any, any, any questions about that? Do, 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 you recognize, do you recognize that this, this is a, a very common human phenomenon, this, this, this thing? Yeah, pretty much, yeah? Any, any questions? Pulse? Pulse check here? Am I speaking too fast? Am I speaking too low? Am I speaking too high? Am I taking, yeah. <laughs> no, anything like that? Okay, thank you. Okay. So, let's, let, let, let's talk about why this is so different. This is so difficult, excuse me. So, schemas, schema biases are extremely powerful. They remain stable by influencing the way we see the world, as I've said many times already, often through bias or prejudice. Um, and that information that, well, here, here's the important thing. They are so stable because what happens is information that does not fit in with that schema that we, that we receive from external cues often goes unseen or is distorted or frequently is rejected, okay? Information that does fit into that is accepted, and in fact, it makes that schema much, much stronger. All we have to do is think about new, the news cycle, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and how, how we look for news that, that, that confirms, and we'll talk about confirmation bias in a second, that confirms those already held beliefs, okay? This is very, very strong, it's prevalent, um, and, 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 it, and therefore, it makes it very difficult to change one's orientation, to change biases. So let's talk about how many different, there's, there are all kinds of, of biases that we can talk about. We've all experienced affinity bias. When we meet somebody who just kind of reminds us of ourselves or with whom we have this situational empathy, right, you know, and we provide those micro affirmations. Oh, yeah, I like your shirt. Yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah. You know, yeah, that sort of thing. Or, wow, this guy, you know, this guy, he's from Texas. I'm a Texan, by the way. Uh, <laughs> or let me say, um, I don't like snow, and these are not ordinarily not the shoes I would be wearing with this suit. <laughs> You know, because I don't want any, any, you know, biases about my, my, my ability to dress or not dress based on my shoe choice today. So anyway, but yeah, so those little affirmations, right? Uh, micro affirmations. So confirmation bias, which I just uh, referred to, is a tendency to, sh to search for, to interpret, to favor, and to recall information in a way that confirms one's pre-existing uh, beliefs um, uh, or, or a hypothesis. Um, In-group bias. Okay, that's a manifestation of kind of our tribalistic tendencies. Uh, it, it, it renders us kind of sometimes suspicious, sometimes fearful, if not really disdainful, of people outside of our immediate group. Maybe, you know, maybe those who don't work in ARL libraries, you know, we just, oh my gosh, you know, we, don't, we, 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 we can't collaborate with people who aren't working in ARLs, you know, that sort of thing. You know, someone from a different sector or just, you know, or, or someone, frankly, from, uh, of another race. Um, that, that's how something like that gets, uh, gets built. Positive or negative expectation bias is when you know, we put a lot of weight on previous events, thinking that somehow they're going to influence future outcomes. You know, like the you know, coin tosses, you know, you think, okay, you know, you get heads, you get heads, you get heads. Okay, this time, tails is really going to happen. You know, that's how people get addicted to gambling, for example. Um, observational or selection bias, that, that effect of suddenly noticing things that we didn't notice before. We've all been through this, right? Where we wrongly assume that frequency has increased. So, for example, when one buys a new car, you know, there's this phenomenon where all, all, all of a sudden recognizing, wow, there are lots of people with my, my kind of car, you know? <laughs> or, or the example, again, is when, when, when women find out they're pregnant, all of a sudden they, they, they recognize all of the pregnant women that are in their environment, you know, as they go through day-to-day. Uh, -day. No, probably not. There are, a lot of, there are a lot more pregnant people. It's just probably that you're, you're slightly more aware of that, right? Uh, and stand, status quo bias. Uh, humans tend to be, I'm going to say this a couple times. This is a large generalization. People tend to be apprehensive and resistant to change, okay? That's, that's a fact of human nature, which often leads us to make, us, to make decisions that are going to ensure that things are going to remain the same, that we're going to keep the status quo and change as little as possible. So part of the perniciousness of this type of bias is the unwarranted assumption that making a different decision, doing things differently, is somehow going to be worse, 
you know, I use our, our healthcare system, you know, we're so scared to make changes because we just don't know what it looks like on the other side. Um, negativity bias, sometimes called negativity dominance, is when negative impressions about someone or something skew one's impression or view, even when uh, positive effects or interactions dominate in the aggregate. There's been a lot of research on this, and you can, you can Google this, but you know, there are a lot of, some researchers say that there's, there's a one to seven uh, po uh, negative to positive ratio, that if you're gonna have a positive view of someone and they do something negative, that they actually have to have seven positive interactions with that person in order for that, that opinion of that person to go a different direction, okay? So lots of different, lots of different types of biases that, that affect our life. Stop me at any time if you have a question or a comment. In the meantime, I'll hydrate. Okay, so here's, the, 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 I think, the, tr the tricky part. What the science of implicit bias does for us, um, especially in, 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 in professions like us that uh, you know, are, are dominated by, by majority cultures, quite, quite frankly, um, is it provides an entry point, right? An entry point where um, for, for, for many people who are starting to think about their own mindset, uh, their own attitudes, their own behaviors with respect to managing difference in the workplace and, and elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in society. So there's been a great deal published in the psych literature, in the business literature, um, and elsewhere uh, about, uh, about, about this um, and, and, and studying the efficacy of, the, of traditional diversity training, whatever that looks like. Okay, so many, many studies about that. And what they have in, in fact found is that traditional diversity training where you go, gather people into a room, and don't make me leave after I say this, uh, <laughs> but when you gather people in a room and give them a lecture or you, you know, these sorts of things, that in fact, it's really not that effective, okay? And one of the reasons it's not effective is because this is the perception of that. You know, whether it's voluntary, whether, you know, whether it's mandatory, which is, is very problematic, but, but, but what it is is that the, the perception is that the goal of the diversity training is to identify and change the bad people. Okay? It's the bad people who, who hold the pre prejudicial views, who exhibit the discriminatory, discriminatory behavior, that they know better, but they simply refuse to act on, on that knowledge. So what implicit bias does, though, is it, it changes the, the, the paradigm, right? The assertion is that we have to shift away from this good guy, bad guy, or good gal, bad gal, because I try to be inclusive, uh, paradigm, right, uh, and mentality, and acknowledge the fact that each of us, in some way, in many ways, uh, each of us is biased against, you know, some groups, uh, sometimes biased against us in our own identity group, actually, uh, and that we, in fact, need bias to survive. Okay, this is why I think it's, it's, it's effective uh, to, to, to talk about these things. So certainly in fight or flight situations where dangers, you know, are, are, are to be sensed and the re reactions need to be instinctual, okay, with any apologies to any Rottweiler owners in the room, they're not all mean, they're not all bad, okay, <laughs> okay, so it's extremely helpful in this regard, okay. Has anybody seen this before? I'm sure many of you have. Right, okay. Also for everyday information processing, you know. Um, give you a chance to read that in case you haven't. So in these instances, implicit bias is extremely helpful for filling in those gaps. But however, it's also not helpful. In fact, it can be very damaging in other contexts. And I'm sure many of you have seen this. We hear, see here two different, very different interpretations of exact same human behavior. This is following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, interpreted by two different new organizations, news organizations in very different ways, with the only difference in that behavior being the color of skin of the people exhibiting that behavior. Okay? So, very, very dangerous. So, how do we, how, what, is, what does this have to do with libraries, right? What does this have to do with the work that we do, um, the engagement, the interactions that we have? Well, it, a, a, a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, it affects hiring, you know, hiring decisions, uh, performance evaluations. It affects promotion, retention decisions. It often uh, affects staffing assignments. I'm, I, I'm not going to go and read all of these. It's probably, hopefully, the only one that I'll do this to. Um, but um, and also, it, it it prevents us from creating environments where creativity and innovation are actually maximized. Okay, 
because of the homogeneity that is that is created when we do this process. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. I'm sure everyone here. Um, oh, good, we're doing okay on time. Um, has heard about numerous studies uh, that have been done about around hiring managers, where uh, there was an older study back from I think 2004, where uh, you know people responded to I think there were actually newspaper uh, ads at that time because I guess that's people still did that in 2004. Uh, so you know, and so the, the, these researchers send out uh, resumes. Uh, in response to all of these different job acts, where and and where in in half of them they identified the people who were applying for the positions, and they created these stereotypically white-sounding names, and then on the other the other half were uh, stereotypically African-American sounded name sounding names, as if there were you know such a thing in, in either. Uh, but at any rate, and and what of course the researchers found was that the the the, the people with you know the, the, and the resumes were identical, but the people who were identified. Uh, with the white sounding names receive like 50% or, or 100% more callbacks, something like that. I mean, something ridiculous. So, um, yeah, so I, we've all heard of, of those. those. Those have been replicated. Those also have been replicated both you know, in other countries and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of data uh, about that. So that's just as an example. Um, so um, I think, you know, the implications, again, for, for implicit bias are very helpful for us to think about. Uh, in the way we manage people, but also think about in our context, because I think it's also helpful to think about in terms of how we, what, how we make decisions about collections and how we describe collections um, and how we perform and where we perform outreach and how we provide instruction. Okay, we'll have a little uh, example about, um, about some bias in, in instruction in a little bit. So that's why um, I, I, I frequently get pushback about, you know, some of the sort of extraordinary efforts that we have to, that, that many organizations, associations like myself have to go through to try to get more people of color, more people from otherwise marginalized, underrepresented groups into the profession. And part of that is because the, the system is working so hard against that, <laughs> right? That we have to go through these extraordinary measures to kind of create that equity, to create those opportunities. So think about all, what all of that. Um, let's let's think about a little bit in terms of, of the application of this um, every every day. We talked a little bit about uh, bias in the initial sort of resume review stage, and this isn't selection. So this th is thinking about who are we recruiting into our profession and into your organization. Um, certainly, I have found myself wow, you know, I, I see two two resumes. Oh, here's somebody from. You know, Joe's University in North Dakota. Oh, here's somebody from Harvard. Okay, you know, I mean, these are the type of people that we work, work working in, in research institutions. Well, okay, let's think a little bit about their story. Let's think a little bit about their experience. And, you know, am I favoring those people only because of that one credential, right? Um, here's something that we do, unfortunately, in, in libraries and archives a lot. We create that position description, and it has... 14 required qualifications and 21 preferred qualifications. We can have a long conversation about why I think that is putting us as, as organizations at a terrible disadvantage and the people that you're actually recruiting into those, those positions, who by the way already know, who, know how to do that job because you're, recruit, you know, you're recruiting them for skills they already have, uh, they are in fact uh, being put at a disadvantage because you're not challenging them, you're not providing them experiences that are really going to allow for growth. We'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, and then this, this is very problematic, uh, the focus on fit. Um, you know, people will say, you know, this is, this is, really, this is really coded. Uh, we'll talk about what this looks like in, a, in an organizational context in a little bit, but you can't quantify this, right? You can't put this on a spreadsheet. How do you measure that? Okay, and then, you know, again, we'll talk, we can talk about the science behind actually focusing on difference is actually going to create such advantage in your organizations for things like decision making, problem solving. There's tons of science behind that. So where working against fit is actually going to be your, the advantage uh, for the organization. Okay, let's look at these. Other, other ways we, we have bias. <clears throat> Non-traditional career paths, right? Um, I, I don't need to read those examples. You know, how do we look at resumes, people coming into our profession that have had these experiences in their lives? Again, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to emphasize two fundamental truths about human nature, understanding that these are gross generalizations, people are resistant to change, okay? 
People are more comfortable working with and interacting with people like them, that either look like them externally, that act like them, that speak like them, et cetera. Okay, fundamental truths. We can talk, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in an organizational context here. Okay, um, here's the, uh, the, the, an evaluation bias that, uh, again, another study, this was done out of some researchers out of the Illinois State University where uh, they had somebody who was posing as a guest instructor for one of the Common Core classes that they have, maybe it was an English 101 or something like that. So exactly same, same instructor, uh, teaching multiple sections of that class. And in one section, it was a male instructor. He identified his partner as being female, or not in 50% in of, the, of the sections. And then the other 50%, he identified his partner as being male, okay? And so you can read for yourself what the, what the results were uh, when those students thought that he was in a same-sex relationship. Exactly same content, same instructor. Um, just a few other things about, <clears throat> excuse me, as I go through Purdue here, um, <laughs> um, um, a, few, a few, oh, let, let's go back a little bit, I'm sorry. So, um, oh, I have these out of order. Okay, let's, let's go with this. So, here are a few ways um, that I hope, a little su some suggestions for, for, for con confronting your own biases um, and for maybe deconstructing and dismantling them, okay? Lots of good strategies out there. Lots of good strategies. How many of you heard, I'm sure most of you have heard, but how many of you have heard about Project Implicit at Harvard? At Harvard? Oh, okay, only a few of you. And have you taken the tests? You have taken the tests? Yes, yeah, so, so fascinating. Tons and tons of research around implicit bias. I invite you, just Google Harvard implicit bias, and, and they have um, constructed a series of tests that helps you gauge, just, just personally, you don't have to share this information with anybody, you know, where you stand, where you have biases towards you know, several for, for, for around sexual orientation, around race, around gender, these sorts of things. So it, it, it really provides an honest look about what that looks like for you in your life. So uh, I, I challenge you to do that. Um, you know, again, we tend to gravitate to, toward people who look like us and who, and who act like us. So you have to work consciously against that. You know, surround yourself, you know, try to, 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 to figure out how to navigate through through social circles, through professional circles, where you can counter that, where you can get exposure to people who are really different than you are, um, through, through whatever mechanism. Uh, because in fact, you know, familiarity does, does, does breed empathy. Um, I challenge our students to do this in recruitment programs all the time, is to do an audit of, of whom, those with whom you interact on social media, Facebook, you know, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, whatever that is. Um, you know, are, are all of those people like you? Are they, do they share your gender, do they share your race, that sort of thing. You know, challenge yourself to, to, to think about extending that circle, widening that circle. Uh, take on a, a sparring partner, take on an issue and do, you know, do due diligence, do some research and try to get to know an issue from the other person's perspective. And in fact, try, try, try to be that devil's advocate to somebody, maybe you know, someone who you trust. These are good strategies, I think. Um, this is hard, you know, and this is something that we, we don't do well as an organization. Um, be open to having conversations about power and privilege and about possibly bestowing, if not sharing, power with people who are different than you are. You know, look for those opportunities. What, is those, what do those opportunities look like uh, on a personal level and uh, in a pro professional level? Um, and this is a little bit tricky, but be deliberate about, deliberate about, I can't say that deliberate about constructing diverse groups in any type of work that you do. We'll talk a little bit, I hope if we have time, about tokenism, and that's, that's a little dangerous because, you know, you don't want to pick, okay, we want the gay guy on the selection committee, on the search committee, and we want the African-American woman, you know, that, oh, sorry, hey, Siri, you're trying to talk to me. No, that's me, that's okay. <laughs> she doesn't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, that, that can be very, very dangerous, and we'll talk a little bit about a, a concept called to cultural taxation that we really, really need to avoid. But at any rate, do think about, uh, about diversity uh, with respect to perspectives, you know, identity, that sort of thing. I get a little nervous when we talk about diversity of thought. Uh, I can, we can talk a little bit why that, that phrase makes me nervous too. But anyway, because, I mean, cognitive diversity is very real and it's extremely important, but I, you know, we don't want to get away from conversations about the, the, the systems that, that make people of color 
you know, people who identify as GLBTQI, people with disabilities, marginalized within our profession. So that's, that's my concern about that. I hope that resonates with you. Okay. Um, bias in the interview, uh, stepping back a little bit. Uh, but, but this is still thinking about, about strategies for mitigating, uh, minimizing uh, bias. Uh, treat all candidates as, as, as valued professionals because they are, you know, ones that, that come in, ones that you work with every day. Uh, and again, not, not representing all of the issues of their particular group, you know. I can tell you how many times I have been asked to sit on panels because I'm Latino. I mean, I mean it, it happens so many times. Uh, first of all, you, you, there's no time to accept all of those invitations to do that. Second of all, I, I was asked to do that when I was, I'm just going to say this very candidly, when I was in, in, in Tennessee, and I was asked to sort of express to people what the concerns were, what life was like living in eastern Tennessee when there was a huge migration of Latino immigrants. And guess what? Most of those immigrants were from Central America. My heritage is Mexican. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to tell you, you know, what it feels like to be a Guatemalan immigrant. I, I don't know what that reality is like. So don't just don't assume. Same thing. Uh, well, we can we can talk about we, we can talk about this for a long time. <laughs> uh, um, when you bring candidates in, make sure that they meet diverse folks if they want to. You should not feel reticent about asking if that's a particular need because there's some people some people don't want to have anything to do with with you know there are diverse folks who don't want to be on on diversity committees okay they right <laughs> you know don't assume that they're going to be committed to that work and want to engage in that work some of them just want to do their job and that's fine too but ask them you know it would it be important for you to get connected to you know whatever the you know african american studies faculty whatever that looks like um, Here's uh, another little piece of data. Studies show that if you interview only one woman, one African American, one Latinx person, the likelihood of that one person getting that job is almost none. If you increase that, if you, in increase, if you invite two African Americans, that likelihood is exponentially higher. Yeah, there's lots of research behind that. Under where the candidate is on the EI spectrum, you know, provide, provide space for people to regroup. Interviews can be arduous, <laughs> you know, lots of, lots of E time, lots, lots of uh, people connecting time. Uh, honor where they are and provide space for people to regroup, to re-energize, that sort of thing. Um, that's, that's important for us to think about. Um, all of this, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The, so, thank you. Extrovert, introvert, that's all. Yeah, extrovert, introvert, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So sorry about that. Thank you for making dumb assumption. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, um, I'll, I'll let you read through this. Um, I think some of the things that are important to think about, speaking of the EI uh, uh, spectrum, uh, I, 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 in, in as much as I do this, I'm actually a cusper on that EI spectrum. I require a lot of time by myself to regenerate and to regroup. And the same thing when I'm, in a, when I'm doing committee work, I'm not the type of person who is going to talk a lot, you know, who's going to, you know, contribute to the conversation just off the cuff. I need time to listen to what a person has to say. I need time to process that. So in as much as it takes a little bit more time, provide that opportunity for people to have that reflection and to provide feedback, either verbal or, you know, writing or what, whatever sense makes, makes um, sense to them. Um, Think about whatever process it is that you're going to have a discussion with the people involved in that process about the norms for getting that work done. If it's evaluation criteria that you're, you're thinking about, then how are we gonna measure that? You know, what does that look like? Make sure that there is, have a discussion about creating some consistency about the way you're measuring, measuring that particular criterion if you're uh, evaluating somebody. And, and just be open about it. Just be open about the possibility that, 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 that biases are going to creep in. That's okay. But if you just voice it, that might, you know, mitigate that uh, from happening. So, okay. Um, we're doing okay on time. So, again, thinking about um, how we measure others' work, um, how we uh, determine whether people are going to remain part of our organizations, I, I offer these these, these few things, this idea of cultural taxation, as we, we mentioned, there's a lot of literature out there about particularly around people of color, particularly in academe, when you know, the, an assistant professor comes in and this person is African-American, they're gonna be asked to be on all kinds of committees. 
They're going to be asked to mentor all kinds of students that identify with them. They're going to be asked to do so much that has nothing to do with their position description. They're not going to get any money for it. They're not going to get any credit for it in the promotion and tenure process. So we really have to think about what that looks like. Okay? Our reward systems. Okay? This, is, this, this may be challenging. Okay? Just bear with me. Please don't leave the room. <laughs> we have to interrogate our reward systems. Do our reward systems value things that are reflective of majority cultures majority and, and, and the, the values of majority cultures and not, and not consider whether or not those values are important to people of color or from other marginalized groups. It doesn't mean that those aren't important values. It doesn't mean that it's not good. But the problem is those conversations have never taken place. We've never interrogated whether those values are consistent. You know, and I used the, 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 the Latino model a while, a, a while ago. If you, if you tell me, invite me to dinner, my brother, you know, he, my brother <laughs> hosts Thanksgiving dinner every year, and he tells us every year, oh, show up about 1 o'clock. What that means for, in my family, I can show up at 1, at 1.30, 1.45, you know. It's very, time is very fluid. That is very much part of my culture. That is very much part of the Latinx culture. But on the other hand, my father was a bricklayer. He was a, a stonemason. And when he didn't get jobs, he couldn't feed his family. So he is a stickler for time. When you say, be here at 1 o'clock, my dad showed up at 12.30. Okay, so do you see where there, that, that, that dissonance is? Okay, but again, thinking about workplace, it's not that people don't value other people's time. It's not that people don't value the structure. Sometimes there are just, we value different things because of our difference. Uh, we talked about organizational fit. Here's agentic communal. Check for those dominant voices in the room. Where ag agentic is part of that, that sort of, uh, it's a power differential paradigm. There, it's something that we think of as, as being kind of patriarchal, uh, frankly, whereas the, the communal are the, those values that are you know, team-based, that are nurturing, those things that we kind of characterize as feminine characteristics, okay? Are we valuing as, as, an, as, as a community the agentic um, behaviors and mindsets over the communal? Um, I think... Again, I don't, I don't need to read these uh, bullet points to you. The last thing I'll say is that one of the things that really helps organizations counter implicit bias is thinking about developing a growth mindset. Thinking about you know, what, what, what it is that I need to know to take me from point A to point B and understanding that this is in fact a process. It is not a destination. Okay, we're going we're, we're gonna to mess up. I mess up as a diversity practitioner all the time. I'm still really learning to deal with things around, for example, gender identity. You know, I, 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 I'm trying to grapple with those behaviors that are the most inclusive. I haven't been very good about that. So that's okay. You know, the, the, the thing is just acknowledge that you've made a mistake or you've gained a new sense of understanding about something and go on. I think if you've offended anybody, if they see you processing through that behavior in that way, they're going to be very much on your side. Um, let's see here. We're running out of time, but we're good. Um, so this is how implicit bias rears its ugly head in an organizational context. Okay, This is called the attraction selection attrition model. What this model says is that people are differentially, this is based on decades upon decades of research, people are differentially attracted to organizations, indeed to professions, differentially based on what? Based on interests and personality. Thought I was going to say skills? I thought I was going to say skills too, okay? So <laughs> organizations, okay, that, that, that's how we're attracted. I mean, you know, who us? There's so many people in this organization, in your organization, who can get, make so much money, more money, out in the business sector, right? You hear, you're here because you, you, you honor, respect the values, the type of work that libraries do. Uh, libraries, archives, cultural heritage and memory organizations, right? Okay? Um, some generalizations, I understand. Sometimes there are, you know, situational things with family and that sort of thing. I understand that. But for the most part, that, that, that's what attracts us to this type of, of, of work, to any kind of work. Now, what happens is in the selection process, organizations tend to select people who are compatible 
um, for many different kinds of jobs, right? We do many different types. We have many kinds of different you know, functions within a library. So in that way, organizations end up choosing people who share many common characteristics, attributes, traits, although they might, might not share common competencies. Okay, very important to remember. So what happens is, you know, we tend, again, we tend to recognize and recruit people who are a little bit, who are kind of like us, you know, who think like us, you know, who fit in with our organization. And we tend to weed out people who challenge our processes, who challenge the status quo, whom we don't feel necessarily comfortable or competent uh, about interacting with and engaging day, on a daily basis. So what happens is they're, they're weeded out, okay? And at the end of the day, our organization ends up being more homogeneous than what we started with. This is that persistence, that persistence that has created a, a, a metric in terms of racial, and I realize I framed a lot of this around racial and ethnic um, sort of representation and diversity, um, but you know, we can certainly talk about other things, lots of other things, but, but that's why we as a profession have remained at about 15% representative of racial and ethnic minorities in, in, in the library science uh, profession for about the last 40 years. And in fact, it's actually kind of declining if we dig deep into the, into the data. Okay, so this is a, 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 a very difficult <laughs> uh, thing to counter, um, and uh, I hope providing this opportunity to kind of look at it straight in the eye um, and to recognize it, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we provided a little bit of, a, of, of, of some evidence about why it's so important to think about, about all of this. So, um, I want to leave a little bit of time for, for discussion and everything, but I just want to maybe highlight a couple of things. We cannot forget this, how our systems were built. What I tell people all of the time, if we think about higher education, higher education was never really established in its origins to be an inclusive club, okay? It was founded in order to keep certain, a certain demographic, <laughs> largely male, Western European, um, Christian, um, in power, literate, sorry, I forgot that one, in power. Okay, I, I, I think and I hope that that, that mission has changed significantly, uh, particularly here in the United States, but we can't forget about that. And we, we can't forget, the thing that's difficult to grapple with is the extent to which those origins have created over a course of time a structured, scaffolded, whatever you, you want, an accumulation of advantage for people who identify as being from a majority cultures, majority identities, that sort of thing. Uh, and how it, it works counter to creating diverse, inclusive uh, environments. Um, I will tell you, I engage a lot with people who are new to the profession. I'm going to say a bad word. I engage a lot with millennials um, <laughs> I, um, who want to be part of this, this, this profession. They are so impatient with the lack of change, with the slow rate of change that is happening in our organizations, at least with, with respect to representation that sort of thing. We're going to lose a lot of them. We're going to lose a lot of really good people uh, if we don't get our act together. Um, this myth of the level playing field, we didn't talk about, you know, we, that's, that's, a different, that's a different presentation, but, uh, you know, the idea that, that, that if we give everybody the same advantage, that everybody's going to end up in the same place, you know, that whole bootstrap sort of, sort of thing. Again, if we think about the systemic, you know, it's not going to happen. When we think about higher education, in spite of the fact that um, people who identify as white or Caucasian are 55% of all those enrolled in higher education, baccalaureate degrees are conferred upon 75% of, of, of people who identify as, as, as white. Okay? We're losing a lot of people, a lot of the Latinos, a lot of the, the African Americans, a lot, certainly people who identify as indigenous, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, that sort of thing. Um, again, just some caveats here. Um, science is actually <laughs> showing that implicit bias training actually increases implicit bias. Okay? <laughs> and, and you know what? Well, you know, you go through this training, you've, you check that off. Good. We're, not, we're no longer biased. You know, we, we've, we've had that training, okay? I have to constantly interrogate that and think about that. Um, I don't need to read all of this. Um, yeah, I, I think most of that speaks for itself. Um, 
And the last point before I open it up for questions and discussion, again, um, em embrace discomfort, please. <laughs> we, we need you to do that <laughs> in order to affect true change, authentic change, hopefully enduring change. And the last thing is just to, again, remember, I've said it before, uh, do not d seek growth, intentional growth and not perfection, okay? Um, and I think if you just put on that hat, I think hopefully uh, you can grow as an organization and we can grow as a profession, we can grow as a society together. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, oh, I'll let you read that. You know, I, I'll just say as, a, as, a, as someone who does a lot of work and, and because, like, yeah, I, li I like that. <laughs> um, it says a lot about a lot of things right now. Um, um, and in my role at the Association of Research Libraries, you know, we do a lot of, uh, we have a lot of recruitment programs. And the one thing that I'll say, and I, it, and I recognize that this is going to be challenging, and I say this all the time, you know, we, we've been talking for so long about the lack of, of at least, you know, racial and ethnic diversity in the profession. And so, you know, what's been the, the strategy? The strategy, me, strategy has been recruitment. You know, okay, let's, let's have scholarship. You know, let's provide professional train, professional development and mentoring and that sort of thing. The, 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 the reason that we're at stasis with respect to this, I, 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 I'm going to kind of guess here, um, is that uh, solely that, <laughs> That strategy is highly problematic, okay? Um, first of all, it's, 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 it's important. If we think about the demographics of, of those in this group, we're not going to significantly change the demographic makeup of the boomers, right, who are already in the profession. We're not going to get somebody who has had a 20-year management uh, career at Walgreens and ask them to come be uh, director of scholarly communications at a research library, right? That's not going to happen. So that entry level is kind of that one point of opportunity to get, to get diverse folks in, diverse voices and what have you. Uh, but here's the problem with that. The problem is that the expectation has always been that we're gonna invite these people <laughs> into our profession, into our spaces, into our world, okay, and expect that it's gonna be them that assimilate. You know, they're gonna make all the adjustments. They're the ones that who are gonna, and we mentor them. We mentor them, well, you gotta, you know, <laughs> You gotta not speak this way when you go to your interview. You have to dress this way, in spite of my boots. Uh, where you have to dress this way, if you, you know, we 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 teach you, we teach people to play the game. Okay, there's a little bit of necessity in that because that's the system that we have. That's that's the environment that we have. We we need to be able to train people to navigate and hopefully to still find um, fulfillment um, from from those and, and success uh, in those environments. But we need to have uh, conversations about organizational culture. We need to have conversations about the systems that have created that low representation to begin with, okay? And we think that it, it, it has nothing to do with, you know, X, Y, or Z. It has nothing to do with the history of, of the slave trade in the United States. Um, in fact, it does. In fact, if we really interrogate this, in fact, it does. That historical legacy is with us today. Um, so I realize that could be a very challenging thing for me to say, uh, but 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 I, I really hope that this can start some some discussions um, uh, amongst yourselves, and um, certainly willing to have those discussions. So, so anything else? I welcome discussions, questions. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's for, for a couple of those, I think the two reasons that I have read about in the literature, so the question was why, through, through the studies, why is it determined that implicit bias training is, is actually ineffective? Um, and one of them, like I said, is it's, it's assumed by many people that, be, that once they go through training, that they have those proficiencies, okay, and they, they, they kind of forget what that looks like on the ground. Um, the other thing, and this is really, really tricky, um, the other thing is people, people don't like to be told what to do. That's another kind of truth about, about humanity. I mean, really, honestly, no, nobody, none of us like to be told what to do. And, 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 and in many instances, there, there is, you know, there's counter, you know, there, there's counter behavior. Uh, and not because people want to be bad or that sort of thing, but, you know, they, they just, they, 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 they feel, people feel that they are being forced to change rather than being invited to change. Um, 
it's a little bit tricky, you know, because like I said, you know, people from marginalized groups have always been the ones kind of forced to make those changes. And I'd like to, I'd like to, as, in, in, as, as forcefully, but as kindly as I can, would like to invite people from majority cultures to come over to my side a little bit, <laughs> you know, to live in my space, in my skin a little bit. Um, so I, I would ask you to think about that. But yeah, those are, those are some of the major reasons. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sure. uncomfortable right right yep a lot mm -hmm. uh-huh uh-huh mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sure, absolutely. So, yeah. So, so what? What can? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm going to try to distill this. You know, uh, so, um, what can uh, the the majority in this profession, white females? Uh, that's that's the majority in our profession. Uh, what can we do to? What what can you do? to counter some of the behavior, some of the mindsets that might be creating uncomfortable environments for people who ident don't identify similarly. I, I really struggle. I shared um, some, some readings um, with, with, with Myra a little bit. Uh, Mira, I'm sorry. My assistant is, oh, it is Myra. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, Myra, uh, a little bit earlier. There's a, there, there's a lot of, of talk about, again, about thinking about a lot of in the literature about the lack of efficacy of so many diversity efforts and the fact that none of these are centered around the systems that have created these inequalities. I think that's really, really important and very, very valid. But I think we have to start somewhere and thinking about or, or having an opportunity to think deeply about your own experience, your own mindsets, um, and, 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 and thinking about that. Going through the implicit bias test, for example, that's, I, I think that's that's one thing, reading the literature, reading some literature around maybe critical theory around gender, you know, gender studies, race, ethnicity, that sort of thing. We're all extremely busy people, but I mean, I think that the degree to which white females <laughs> can, can commit to that growth, I think is going to be very, very productive. But also understand, again, you know, that, that, that impatience, the, the impatience with, with change from a lot of people. I understand, let's, let's use Chris as an example. She won't mind uh, my, my doing this. Um, Chris is a very different type of leader than I am. Chris is an in-your-face, you know, very, we got to call the stuff out. We got to call it what it is. I mean, that sort of thing. And I believe that if we don't have leaders like that, that we're never going to get anywhere. Okay, there have been so many social movements in the, in, in the world <laughs> that if we didn't have people that were willing to get into the face and challenge the status quo, the change would not have happened. Okay, I also understand, and I'm, I also understand that, that it's hard. I understand that people have a limit in terms of the amount that they can be challenged before shutting off psychologically, cognitively, that sort of thing. So where do we find that sweet spot? Now, that's not finding and searching for common ground. That's not what it is. I, I, like I said, we've been trying to find common ground for the last 50 years, and it's gotten us nowhere. Okay? So I, I, I challenge people to, to, to be thinking about what, what this looks like um, and engaging with the, 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 the philosophies, engaging with the, the research, uh, engaging with the history. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a, a, a director who's now retired, an ARL director, who over the many course of, of the years that I was involved with ARL and she was too, we never had a conversation about my portfolio, about 
you know, the importance of the work that I do for the association, about the value that we're bringing to the association, nothing. I don't know how she fell into this, but she went to a training program in North Carolina called the Racial Equity Institute. And it's a two day, very intense sort of thing. And, and you know, the way it's built from what I understand, it requires that people, that there be broad representation in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, that sort of thing. And they dig very deeply into the systemic, that, that history of accumulation of advantage for people from majority cultures. And she invited me to, to, to dinner one time, and man, she unloaded. And she, she, was, she was a changed human being. But until she made the commitment to doing that, she wasn't engaged, right? So, it, it, you know, everybody is, is attracted and, and can be brought to different sorts of experiences that will allow that growth to happen. But, you know, again, thinking about it as a journey, as, as a journey of growth and understanding that, you know, if you'll pardon the colloquial, you're just going to step in it sometimes. You, you are, and, that, and that's okay. You're making the effort, and that's what I, I feel is, is most important. Is that helpful at all? <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yes. <clears throat> oh, gosh. <laughs> I can maybe point you out. There are so many resources. I mean, you know, you, you, you could spend, one could spend a lifetime reading up on that. Um, I, 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 I can share that, uh, yeah, certainly uh, with folks um, and try to curate that a little bit. You know, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of good literature out there. So, sure. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yes. Yes. I am on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not terribly engaged with it because, you know, I'm just, but, but and I, I am on Facebook. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did that a lot when I was in the profession. I'm a recovering music librarian, by, by, by the way. So anyway, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's, the, and, but, but it's also a very difficult um, question. I don't, I mean, I certainly don't think you want to, as an organization, be put in the position of kind of weeding out, you know, people because of particular biases, that sort of thing. I mean, obviously, if somebody says, I'm a proud, you know, card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan, I might think about, you know, okay, well, what does that mean? So, I mean, <laughs> you know, who's, who's going to articulate that? Uh, but um, but I, I, I think it's more of a, of a, it, this is, it sounds dramatic to say, it's more of an ethos. It's not necessarily are there appropriate questions, are there, well, there certainly are lots of inappropriate questions, you know, like what religion are you, you know, who are you married to or partnered with, I mean, all that sort of thing, and there are lots of inappropriate questions. But it, it, it's more of setting the stage for, you know, creating comfort for, for that candidate, understanding that not everybody is the sort of agentic, gregarious you know, person who's going to go out there and, and engage. I mean, we certain, there are a lot of people on the opposite side of that spectrum who are attracted to our profession. Now, it doesn't mean that if they're a liaison librarian that's going to be, you know, con, uh, charged with creating faculty, you know, relationships and, and doing all kinds of outreach and everything that, that you want the shyest, meekest person doing that job. Of course, you have to think about what that looks like. But, I mean, I, I think it's important to gauge what – if that person were to come into our community, both the professional community and the broader community, what is going, that person going to need to sustain them? That, that's, that's the important thing. And that's a very different conversation in New York City than I imagine it would be in Rochester, than I imagine it would be from Ames, Iowa. Okay, very, very different conversation. But, you know, it's, it's just something that we do, we do not consider. You know, we have, a, we have this, this framework for how everybody is interviewed. Uh, you know, because of equity concerns and all that sort of thing, there's just no, you know, no flexibility in that. And, and that, that is very much putting us at a disadvantage. Yeah, thank you. Yes.
Sure. Fair. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Very fair. Right. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Very complicated. And the other thing that I'll t tell people all the time, um, if I had all the answers, I'd be making a lot more money than I'm making right now. So, <laughs> so how do you challenge that concept of fit? What, what people are do a lot of people, are, organizations are tending to do is to really focus on those quantifiable things. You know, really focus on the skills. Really focus on the skills. Really focus on, again, thinking about the growth mindset, thinking about the opportunities for growth and development that that, might, that position might afford us. Because, I mean, how many, how, how many positions of people retiring or people leaving are reposted exactly as the person who's retired? And, right, it's not, it's not happening, right? <laughs> yeah, so everything is changing. <laughs> everything is changing. And so, but, and, and if we kind of frame the conversations about in, in a futuristic way, thinking about what, what may be and is impossible as it might be to imagine that, what kind of skills and competencies might be needed in five or ten years, that's going to provide that opportunity for growth. The, the, the only thing that I can think of in terms of countering fit is to have a conversation about countering fit. <laughs> Sometimes you have to take the risk, and this is very dangerous, and I'm, I, 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 I'm a little squeamish even saying about, even saying it, but uh, sometimes you have to intentionally hire for difference. That person may have a, a world perspective or a skin color or, you know, a, a, a profile, a professional profile that is very different than the one that you had envisioned for that. Now, the danger is you get, again, you get that person in, you know, how, is your climate ready? Is, is your organization ready to welcome that person and to create an environment where that person can really thrive, can succeed? Um, that's really, really, really tough. And so that's why I'm having a lot of trouble, <laughs> you know, articulating an, an answer to this. But again, uh, you know, when I see people who are making great strides and there, there, there aren't, there are no exemplars in this. Nobody is doing everything perfectly. I think if you would talk to Chris Berg, she would say, my organization is really struggling with this. Like every organization, there are a lot of people that are doing pieces of it very, very well. But, and, and, and some of the organizations that, that are doing pieces of it very well are, are, are doing exactly that. They are, they are thinking about, okay, you know, well, I'll give you a, a, an example. A, a person, well, this is out, out, out of, I can, I can say this, in, in a historical um, society, uh, it was, I'm sorry, it was, a, it was an association um, that, that is associated with historical si societies and a new, uh, a new person came in uh, and they were hiring for somebody and they came up with the list of finalists and that director said, there's no diversity in this pool. You didn't recruit right. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to you know, need to hire, you know, but unless you have people who are going to challenge that, um, that are going to commit to that, uh, and I understand, you know, legality, you know, we, we are conflict averse. <laughs> you know, some unionized shops have very, very strict guidelines. I know there's a lot uh, to think about, but again, it's, it's really about a mindset and not necessarily about the process. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's very hard. <laughs> it's terribly complicated. Yep, yep, yep. Right. Uh, wait. Okay, just one more question. Who gets to go? I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay.
Yeah, yes. Yeah, no, that's, 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 it is very much a management issue, which is why I strongly believe, and again, how do, how do we create that conversation? We, you don't want to force anybody to do diversity training, right? I mean, uh, but by the same token, you want, you want to embed those principles and you want to create an ethos in that organization where you're everything that we're, and I say this all the time, that everything that we do at least is viewed through that lens. Is there an intersection? Is there an implication? <laughs> you know, is there some way of, 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 of you, you know, you examine these processes and, and these functions and you think, you know, is there a role, role for us here to be thinking about how, how diversity, but more so not only diversity because that's only about difference, but how equity and inclusion, you know, if you want to get really radical, you can talk about social justice, but I know how, politis, how politicized that term is. But, you know, is, is there a layer here of consideration for that? And uh, until we make that a default in our thinking, we're going to remain at, 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 at 13, 14% representation. So, um, so thank you. That's, a, that's a very important to think about. Thank you. Thank you all. If you had questions that you didn't have a chance to, to ask and get answered, please jot them down. I'm going to ask a couple of my committee members that work with me to stand at the doors and kind of collect your questions if you've written them down, and we'll make sure to address them with Mark later today. Um, that was a perfect topic to end on because Mark will be talking with the leaders in the, um, right, the River Campus Libraries, the Medical Libraries, as well as the Music Library, and hopefully start, the com start that conversation on what it means to manage diversity, equity, and inclusion in the libraries. So thank you all for your attention. If there are bagels and coffee left, please grab some on the way out. Have a great day. <laughs>